This is the third video stepping you through how we determine what our spin states in the x direction are. So we've used these experimental measurements to come up with a constraint on the overall coefficients. And what I've argued in the last video is that there's some complex phase that we have to account for. Now, for our state, we could imagine that there's some overall complex phase that won't actually matter. So what really matters is the relative complex phase between uh, our two coefficients. So we can choose our first coefficient to be real so that the second one is going to have that complex phase. And in this case, we're going to choose it to be real and positive. This 1 over square root of 2 would have been in both coefficients, so we've pulled it out. So effectively, we're saying that there's this overall coefficient, which is also coming from normalization. And then the individual coefficient uh, here, once we've pulled that out, is 1. And now we have this complex phase. Now notice that for the spin up direction, I've said that it's alpha, and for down, it's beta. That's just a, a Greek letter that we're using as our variable if you wanted to call that um, you know, j and k, whatever you want. We run into a problem often in quantum mechanics that there's a whole lot of variables, and you might not want to use j and k since those are also our directional variables. You maybe never want to use o because it looks like zero. So really quickly we start using Greek letters so that we don't have redundancy with the a, b, c, d that we started with here. So here we have used all of this information. We have used our experimental measurements to get this far, and we still have these unknown variables. So, what do we do now? We have to use one more piece of information, and that is that if we think about these two states, spin up and spin down in the x direction, or our orthogonal states, what that means is that if we take that inner product between them, that's going to equal zero. This is the final piece of information we need here. So this is that idea that there's zero overlap, that if we started with a state that was spin down in x, we would not later find it to be spin up in x, that these are different states. So when we go to use this, we're going to have our inner product on the left, again being the complex conjugate of this. So I'm going to first pull out that 1 over square root of 2, and now we need to go from uh, ket to the bra state. And now this e to the i alpha, because this is becoming our bra state, it's going to be e to the negative i alpha. And then that spin down, oops, I've made a mistake. That spin down bra state. Okay. And then we have now this state can come down directly. 1 over square root of, of 2, and then we have up, e to the i beta, and then down. And again, remember that any time we're not writing a subscript, that implies that it's our, our z basis. So this needs to equal to 0. So as we often do, we are going to FOIL this out. We have four terms. And now, don't forget about these. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply them together and bring them out to the left, giving me a 1 half. And now I know of these four terms, this one will equal 1, because it's the plus with the plus. 1 minus with minus is also 1. And these cross terms of minus with plus, plus with minus, would be 0. So I only have these two terms to worry about. So what I see is I have my plus with plus, and then I'm going to say plus this minus with minus. e to the negative i alpha, e to the i beta, and then minus with minus. So now, what can I do? Here, notice that this 1 half I can actually kind of multiply both sides by it. Since this is 0, it's going to go away. This equals 1 and this equals 1. So I have to come up here to have a little bit of space, sorry. We're now going to have 1 plus e to the negative i alpha e to the i beta equals 0. What does that mean? That means that this term must equal negative 1. That gives us a constraint on the relationship between alpha and beta we can actually go ahead and pick. There's still some kind of overall phase. 
we can go ahead and if we want, we can set this equal to 1. But now, this tells us that if this, whole, if this term here is equal to 1, this has to equal negative 1. So notice that it has, in fact, worked out to be a real number. We've said now that this is equal to negative 1. And so with this convention, our spin up in x state is going to be basically plus added to spin, so spin up plus spin down. But then this is spin up minus spin down with this 1 over square root of 2 for normalization. Where this gets complicated is that once we've assumed this and we go through and we do all of the measurements for the y direction, the constraints that we then have from both the z and the x direction on the y direction means that these will must, these have to be imaginary for the y direction. So all of this framework is a little more complicated than we need, it might seem. However, we actually have to follow these steps and can't choose so freely once z and x have been determined when we're trying to set up y. So the book has gone through all of this. Again, this is kind of page 17 and 18, but it skipped some of the steps. So for those of you who are struggling to follow the book, I hope this has helped clarify a little bit where we get these from.